Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of the Summer Speaker Series, Keep It 100, Rubbing Shoulders with Giants. My two friends, along with our fathers, decided to do something similar to a TED Talk where we would bring in people from the community to talk about athletics and certain aspects of life. This series airs on Zoom every Sunday at 7 p.m. In this series, you will have the opportunity to rub shoulders with giants, listen to their life stories and their journeys to get to where they are now. As the audience, you will be able to ask questions in the chat about each guest that we have. As the audience, you will be muted, but you can still type your questions in the chat and they will be brought up by our monitors. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on our show, please contact one of us. This week's speaker is U.S. Marine Captain Brian Hart. Captain Brian Hart attended St. Peter's University where he graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science. He was commissioned into the Marine Corps through Officer Candidate School and Splatoon Leaders Course in June 2013. He was promoted to First Lieutenant in 2015 and promoted to Captain in March of 2018. In July of 2018, he was transferred to Marine Barracks, Washington and currently serves as the Military District Washington Liaison Officer while also marching as the parade adjutant. He has received the Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal, National Defense Service Medal, and Global War on Terrorism Service Medal. Please welcome Captain Brian Hart. Thank you for joining us tonight, Captain Hart. Absolutely, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for the, for the introduction. Yeah, no problem. So let's get started on your childhood. Tell us about where you grew up and what it was like growing up there. Okay. Uh, so I originally, I was born in Washington, DC, um, moved to Maryland a couple years after that, and then moved to, uh, New York. My family is originally from North Carolina. Uh, my grandma had, had moved North when my mother and, and aunt were, were really young. Uh, so they were living in Durham, uh, originally from, from, uh, from Jacksonville, they moved to Durham and then moved North. Uh, so my mother and them, they, they grew up in New York. Uh, she went to Howard University here in Washington. So that's kind of how we ended up back in Washington. Uh, so from there, back in New York, um, went to school uh, in New York. It was uh, Springfield Gardens, you know, the borough of Queens. Um, pretty cool community. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of interaction, as you can imagine, just with everybody, you know, being in New York, the borough of Queens, uh, you know, people say New York city and they, they automatically assume Manhattan. Um, but the borough, the, the five boroughs make up all of New York city. Uh, and it's very easy to, to interchange, you know, uh, once you're there. Uh, so I went to public school when I was in elementary school, I went to a Christian school when I was in middle school. And then I went back to public because I couldn't stay away from, uh, couldn't stay away from the, the public atmosphere. It was just, it was a different lifestyle. I thought I would like it, didn't really like it, wanted to go back to public school. Um, so went, went back to, to public school for high school, French Lewis. Um, and it was, it was kind of eye-opening in each of those, those segments of my life. Um, I grew up in a black community, Springfield Gardens. At the time I was growing up, was primarily black. Um, so everybody in my elementary school was black. Um, well, let me take it back. Most people in my elementary school were black. I had a couple of Latinos, but by far, uh, underwhelming, uh, minority, um, went to middle school, still in a black community. And when I went to high school, uh, things, things kind of shifted on me because Francis Lewis is located in Fresh Meadows, which is primarily a Asian and Latino community. So I went from being around a lot of people who looked like me to I am now kind of represented how New York actually looks, you know? Uh, so I had a fair mix of, of white, Asian, Latino, um, Pacific Islander uh, in, in there. And it, it, was, it was really cool. Uh, there was a lot of things going into my freshman year of high school that looking back now had a completely 180, you know, 180 side of me. Um, so I am very thankful for that sort of experience. Uh, I understand that not everybody in America gets, gets that. Um, and I, I do think that's a, a, a vital portion of, you know, stepping into adulthood 
experiencing those earlier things uh, or experiencing those things earlier on in your life. Uh, uh, I swam for, I started swimming when I was in going into middle school. Uh, so I continued that through high school. Uh, at, at a certain point in time, my mother had said, all right, so you are so-and-so age, we can either continue doing this or you're in this for a long haul, like make up your mind now. So I decided I was having too much fun with my friends to really quit on that. And it was kind of like the only thing I was caring about. So uh, did that, continued that through high school, had a great time. And that was kind of my token to college. Um, went to St. Peter's University in Jersey City, New Jersey, um, on a, uh, on a, partially on an academic scholarship, but partially on an athletic scholarship. Um, and I mean, it, it kind of was like my gateway to, I'm gonna say the rest of the world, really. Do you have a question for Captain Brian Hart? He's muted. Who was it, John? Reggie. Reggie. Is Reggie muted? Yeah. No. Hold on, Reg. I don't know why you're muted. Reg, it's not showing your name. Oh, here, here we go. One second, guys. Reg, you should be in now. Nope. Here we go, Reggie. Yep. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Hear you loud and clear. Again, thank you, Captain uh, Hart, for joining us. Really appreciate this. And thanks for sharing that uh, timeline with us. Was You talked about growing up and going on to uh, St. Peter's. Was there anyone um, at, in your young age, uh, elementary, middle school, or high school, that inspired you or kind of was like a mentor to you um, to kind of keep you striving to go to the next level? Uh, yes. So I, I had a kind of a couple of different twists and turns in the, you know, the path to where I am now. Um, college was, was always a thing from the beginning. Uh, my grandma went to North Carolina Central. Um, she got her, I want to say she got a master's at Clark Atlanta. And then uh, my mother went to Howard, as, as I mentioned before. Um, my aunt went to City College, uh, part of the, Q the, the City University of New York, CUNY, um, uh, New York school system. Um, a couple other folks in my, in my family went to, went to, to similar universities and, and similar uh, institutions. So college was, was always a thing. Um, there was a point in time in which I had thought, well, do I really want to do this or am I doing it because everybody else wants me to do it? Um, but you, you can see, you can see from an early age, um, the difference that a college education made. Um, I could get out after high school and I could do my own thing and life would be okay, but I'd be taking a chance. I knew what life had the potential to be like with a college degree. I, I did not really see, um, other than my other members in the military, other family members in the military, what life was like without a college degree. So that was part of a chance that I ultimately decided I was not really willing to take. Um, I also really wanted to partake in the college experience. Uh, yes, it's all about you know learning and furthering education, but it's an experience. I, I think it helps propel you stepping into adulthood um, on a smaller scale, kind of, kind of a cushioned scale. Um, so, I would definitely say, you know, closest family members uh, and a lot of the coaches uh, that I've had in my life are definitely, definitely, you know, the, the pushing factor of uh, stepping into higher education. Thank you. Uh, Wilson, do you have a question for Captain Hart? Yes, Captain Hart. Uh when we are a child, always we dream, we dream to be like a, a doctor, to like engineer or a different career. 
when you were a child, you dream to be a, a marine or something else, or do you like the process to the middle school, high school, you decided to, to change, oh, I want to be a marine. Can you explain something like that? So I was kind of all over the place. Um, yes, the, the short answer up front, yes. I, when I was a child, I was like, I want to be a Marine. Um, at the time, of course, had no idea what that really meant. Uh, but I had, a, I had an uncle, I still have an uncle, um, recently retired, uh, retired gunnery sergeant in the Marine Corps. So if you're looking at the, at the, uh, the ranks, he's an E7 in the Marine Corps. Um, and, uh, he was stationed in Jacksonville, North Carolina, as a lot of Marines are, because that's one of the home bases. Um, and so I would spend every summer from really as far as I could remember in North Carolina. And a lot of the time I was spent around him and his buddies. Um, so that was like the, that was a starting factor of, hey, I want to be a Marine because I want to be like him. Um, as I grew, grew older, it kind of turned into, all right, well, like military is not necessarily for everybody. So what if, what if I just turns out to not be my thing? Um, so I was heavily in, interested in marine biology when, uh, when I was in elementary school. And uh, that was great and all, um, but I grew out of that phase. Um, but I, I always had an interest in, uh, in atmospheric sciences, tornadoes, hurricanes, um, climate change, I was born in 91, so climate change was still a turmoil um, in that, you know, in the 90s. I don't really understand why it was such a turmoil, but it was. Um, but it, it was it was always fascinating to me um, how Mother Nature did its thing. So that kind of what that was my my anchor that I that I stayed around, uh, which eventually is how I got to an environmental science degree. Um, I had started out wanting to do earth sciences, uh, thought about doing um, uh, physics because it had an impact in some of the earth sciences, um, thought about geology. It, it kind of it took a couple different turns, um, but I, I eventually found something that, that I really had a passion about, um, not only because it was, it was just fun to learn, but it's it's how you know you're affected in everyday life. You can't you can't go one day without somebody mentioning the weather. It just it can't happen. Um, and so because it's so integral in your everyday life, uh, I, I thought it was like, well, this this is probably this is probably a good place for me to stop and you know plant my flag kind of thing. Uh, then eventually I circled back around to becoming a marine um, when I was gearing up to to leave high school. I was, had all these thoughts and I'm like, all right, well, what am I going to do with my life? And uh, initially I had decided, all right, I'm just going to, I'm going to get out and I'm going to go to boot camp. This is it. But like I said, I was swimming. I really wanted to continue swimming like the, some of my other friends were. And I knew I couldn't do that in the Marines. I just, I knew that that was going to have to take a back seat. Um, and at a certain point in time, I was okay with that. Uh, then I made the decision, well, I can always enlist after I go to college like that. That was not out of the, the, the cards for me. So I'm going to go to school. I'm going to swim and then I'll go enlist in, a, in the Marine Corps. Um, so that, that's kind of how I ended up to where I am today. Evan, do you have a question from the audience? Uh, not right now, but I have a question myself. Captain Hart. So when you were about to leave, for the Marines, how was that like feeling? Like, were you scared, nervous, any of that sort? <laughs> uh, so I was nervous as, as all uh, get up. Um, I don't know if, I'm sure some of you have seen the movie, <laughs> the movie Full Metal Jacket. Uh, that was like the last thing I watched uh, right before I, I went off to, to the Marine Corps. Um, in, the, in the process of signing up for it, I didn't truly learn the difference between being enlisted and being an officer. I didn't really grasp that concept until I got to officer candidate school. And at that point in time, in my, in my heart and in my head, I'm like, well, this isn't exactly what I was thinking, but I'm committed now, so I'm doing it. Um, but leading up to it, the physical aspect, I didn't have a problem with. I was a swimmer. 
Uh, prior to that, I had I was doing martial arts. It, I was always active. This was not the physical portion was not um, uh, overwhelming. There were obviously certain aspects of it that that will challenge you. And if you if you don't find something that's going to challenge you on a daily basis or on a regular basis, you're you're kind of missing out on what life has to offer. Um, but so the physical aspect of it wasn't really there. It was more of a how am I going to fit into this already molded thing um, that has existed for the past 240 something years? And am I going to be good at it? I think whenever you start something new, you're always concerned about being good at what you do. Um, but prior to that, again, I had been, I had been a, a, an athlete. Like I'm, I was used to not being good at something and eventually being good at it. Um, so I, it was a little bit of confidence going in there saying, all right, I know this is, this is really going to suck. Um, but I, I've got to give it my best shot anyway. And, uh, I, I'm going to make it work. Thank you. Uh, Sebastian, do you have a question? Um, none from the audience, but I have one myself. Um, going back to how you were talking about, um, experiencing new things and, how was your experience or how, how did you feel about boot camp before you went to the military? Like, were you thinking like, maybe I won't be able to handle all the screaming or, you know, all the intense workouts or. So, so going into it and I, I do want to, want to clarify here just, just for moving forward. So when you say boot camp, generally you're talking about recruit training, yes. which happens in, in Paris Island and San Diego. I did not go to recruit training. Oh, okay. okay. So when I left for for Officer Kennedy School, I left straight from straight from my college dorm okay. to Quantico, Virginia, where we where the Marine Corps hosts its Officer Kennedy School. Uh, different branches do it differently. The Army does require you to go through uh, their version of recruit training first, and then you go to uh, to Officer Kennedy School. The Marine Corps is a little different. It, that is your indoctrination into uh, what it, what it is to be a Marine. Um, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. But I I think your question was what was what was going through my head beforehand. Yeah, yeah. Did you were there things you were constantly thinking about before you were going that were like you know like yeah like the, the, yeah. they were like things you were worrying about. Yeah. Um, so again, the physical aspect, I was not. I didn't really. Um, I didn't feel like that was going to be the challenge. I did. I worried about tactics. Um, I worried like, you know, I've, I've never prior to officer can school OCS, I had never picked up a weapon other than a knife. You know, I, I, I got a kitchen knife, you know, downstairs, but other than that, I have never brandished a gun, never shot anything else, never blown anything up. It's just something that was not a part of my, my life. Right. So here I go, I get there and they're like, here, here's your M16. I'm like, all right, this is real. I'm doing this. Um, I was not so much worried about the yelling uh, over the years. I got really good at letting things go through one ear and out the other. Um, like really good at it. I'm still really good at it. Um, but so uh, one of the things that was impressed upon me before I went um, were a couple different, what I, what I have deemed them now to be, um, keys to success, right? There, there are six of them for, for all intents and purposes. Um, it applies to OCS. Uh, only three of them actually really apply to real life, but I guess you could finagle it any way you'd like. So the first one, uh, be loud, be loud, um, be fast, um, I'm sorry, violence, intensity, and volume. That's it. Violence, intensity, and volume. You give those three things at OCS, and regardless of what happens to you, you will make it through, right? Um, you got somebody, it, it's a loud environment. It's meant to create chaos. Um, you have to embrace it and be like one with the chaos, right? Um, so that's kind of that violent aspect. It was more like, Hey, I've got this drill instructor yelling at me. Um, 
but he's not really yelling at me. We're just having a really loud conversation. So he screams at me, I scream something back. We're, we're chatting it up, you know? That's kind of how my mindset was with that. Um, speed, everything is fast. You gotta do everything fast, right? Um, so the faster, the, the, the better you could establish shortcuts to different things you were doing, the better your life was going to be. So that went from the first night of me sleeping in my rack under the sheets because, you know, in, in, the, in the squad bay, it's like, it feels like it's 60 degrees. Um, and I have next to no clothes on. I have a t-shirt and shorts on. That went from, uh, from doing that to me sleeping on top of the rack with a, with a, a different kind of poncho liner because that meant that I didn't have to make my bed up in the morning, which then meant that I could take a little bit longer to get dressed because I'm only going to have like 60 seconds to put all my clothes on, you know? Um, and in the beginning, you're going to go through some, some, some grown pains, some struggles. Um, but that, that slowly transforms, you build some resiliency and that turns into, I can do, you know, the thing that used to take me 15 minutes to do before I can now do within three minutes. Um, so moving on the other, the other keys to success would have been always keep, always keep a couple things on you, something to write with something to write on and a timepiece. You always got to know the time. You always got to have something able to, if you can start engaging somebody in a conversation, A, you're probably not going to remember it when you leave, especially if you've never met them before and you're kind of, um, you're kind of in the zone of meeting a new person. But if you have something to write it down with, you can't mess it up, especially if you are now entrusted to carry out, you know, an action that you've been tasked with or what have you. So violent speed intensity and something right on something right with, and you know, you got to know what time it is. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rothica, do you have anything? Yes. I don't have anything from the audience yet. Um, but I did want to ask you a question. At the going back to your childhood, in fact, specifically to your high school, uh, you shared your experiences in elementary, then middle, then high school. And then you mentioned when you went to high school, you entered into a school that had different races. And you made a statement. You said, I liked it. Can you elaborate on what you meant by I liked it? So it, it's something that I, I don't think I truly appreciated until after the fact. Um, one of my best friends in high school was black. The other was, was a, a black straight male. The other one was a, uh, Afro Latina, uh, a, a gay Afro Latina. Um, I swam with, um, a bunch of, uh, a, a bunch of different folks. Some were Asian, uh, some were Chinese, some were Indian. Um, I had a lot of Russians on my team. Um, it was it was my first exposure to some of these some of these uh, cultures. Um, it was it was something that I don't think that sort of a tight environment I could have really gotten anywhere other than the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps does force culture on you, um, but my high school also to put it in perspective, my high school was very was heavily populated. I had. I had 4,600 kids in my class, I mean, in my school. I had 1,100 kids in my graduating class. Um, and I get very jealous when I see other high schools in different states because a lot of, a lot of you know, elementary schools take up you know, a, an, entire, an entire college campus. Um, my high school was not, the physically was not large. So when you, when you are in a tight environment with a lot of people, um, it kind of forces you to learn a lot of things about a lot of, uh, a lot of things about, you know, everybody's culture, um, how to get along with everybody. Um, you're not going to get along with everybody, but you can gain an understanding of who this person is, where they come from and why they are, how they are. Um, when we would go in between classes, it was kind of like, if you can imagine, uh, if you've seen like uh, the Japanese getting onto the, the bullet trains to take off and come back from work, 
that's kind of like what our high school, our, our hallways were like. It, you were packed in there like a like a, a a can of sardines, and you just kind of had to like penguin your way down either to the next floor or down to whatever next classroom you were going to. Um, so it was it was a lot of up close and personal interaction with a bunch of different cultures uh, that I guess were kind of forced upon you um, just because of the environment, but it was. Uh, it was definitely an eye-opening experience because again, I really, other than the military, I'm not really sure where else you could be uh, so exposed to that sort of environment. Great, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. All right, Captain Hart. Uh, I have a question for you as well. Um, so to my understanding, the Marines aren't supposed to be called soldiers. And uh, to me, that sounds like there must be a major difference between the Army versus the Marines. Could you speak a little bit on that? Sure. So um, everybody has little has pride in everything they do, right? Uh, so when you talk about soldiers, it, it, soldiers belong to the Army. Um, I have a lot of pride in, in being a Marine. Uh, I feel as though I have earned that title through blood, sweat, and tears. And so to associate me with the Army is is like, um, it's just kind of bad juju, you know? It's, I, I don't want to be associated with the Army because I'm not them. I, I've done my own set of training that I feel has put me in a better situation than X, Y, and Z. So my, my title is Marine. I have earned that when I graduated uh, OCS, you know what I mean? Or you know, I go to boot camp, I, I earned the title Marine when I graduate boot camp. Uh, we have a, and I'm not sure what the other services do, but for, the, for OCS, we have this, this course that is, it smells terrible. Everything about it is wet. If you're not in like waist deep water, you're probably either just gotten out of it or you're going back in it. Um, some of the things that you're crawling through are probably about boot top high. Um, but there's a, a section in the, uh, there's a section in the course called the Quigley. And the Quigley was named after a former Marine who had gone off and, and, and done great things, I want to say, in, in the Vietnam War. Um, and it's essentially two, two culverts that are pretty much submerged that you have to crawl through in order to navigate through the, uh, through the rest of the field. Um, so when I was going through OCS, we would, ha we would do this course again. And by now, this is like the fourth time you're doing this course. Um, it's really long. You hear it and you're like, oh man, I have to do this again. This is terrible. Um, they took us through this thing. And at the end of the Quigley what is where we were awarded our Eagle Globe and Anchor. Um, I don't have anything right now that I can show you that, that, that what that looks like, but it's, you, you'll see it on the different pieces of our uniform. Um, if you were to look up, uh, uh, the, the uniforms for United States Marine Corps. It's, it's an eagle that's hovering over a globe that its claws are carrying an anchor. Um, that, that handoff right there signifies, congratulations, you are officially one of us kind of thing. Um, for, for boot camp, we have this, this test called the Crucible. And I want to say it's like a, it's a, a 52 hour course um, and you're traveling uh, you're traveling up and down all over God's green earth in Paris Island and the hills of, of, uh, of San Diego. And you're doing it with like two meals. You've got to navigate through a bunch of things. You're tired. You're hungry. You haven't slept in days. But by the end of it, the grit that you have shown has proven you worthy of the title Marine. And so because we take so much pride into it, we don't want to be called soldiers. We don't want to be called airmen. We don't want to be called Coast Guardsmen, if that's a thing. We're Marines. Thank you. Mr. Reggie, do you have a question for Captain Hart? Yes, Captain Hart. Um, going back to your education, um, you talked about your high school and having 4,600 students. Could you tell our young people on the call, like, what type of student you were coming through high school? <laughs> and um, why St. Peter's? Did you consider any other colleges, or universities, or trade schools? 
Well, I only I only talk about my type of student because you asked. Otherwise, I would not have mentioned it. <laughs> um, so freshman year, freshman year was rough for me. Uh, it was a new transition. I'm I'm making new friends. I'm still not really sure how to act. I'm I'm you know coming into teenage. I I was a freshman. Um, I was my freshman year was twelve going in. Uh, I was twelve years old going into thirteen. So I was you know I. I'm still trying to navigate like my own aura and I got to deal with everybody else's. So I, I was mixed. I was lost in the crowd um, to, to, to put it best. Uh, I think my, my family did the best they could to try to keep me on a straight and narrow. Um, but I think my freshman year, I was, I was very much so losing myself to the world. Um, it kind of got, I kind of had a reality, reality snap when um, I got to the end of freshman year and, and it was like, hey, you might not pass math, which A, I was really good at math, so that was just stupid. But B, me not passing math then would have meant I had to go to summer school, which then would have meant I would not have been able to swim in the summer, which would have put me behind the rest of my peers and and impede any sort of progress that I had going into the rest of my swimming career, which that was what I held up high. That was it. You mess with that and you got to go. And so I had the coming in Jesus moment where it's like, okay, I can't mess up in school anymore. I can't hang out with this crowd because all we do is hang out. You know, we're, we're, we're not going to class. We're not talking about things to be great. We're just, we're going around causing trouble. That's all we're doing. So I had that coming to Jesus moment, the end of math. It turns out I passed math, uh, barely. And I got to swim that summer, which again, helped progress, you know, into the rest of the years. But going into sophomore year, I was like, all right, things have got to change. I can't do this anymore. So I, I remained in contact with that sort of group of friends because I do think you need to know a, group, a, a piece of everybody. Um, uh, you never know when you might need them. But I had a different group of friends that I was starting to, starting to, to click with. And these folks were, you know, they're, they're, they're not the, oh man, I got a 98. I'm so mad at myself. But they're like, hey, you know, you got an 80. Uh, why'd you get an 80 when you could have gotten a 90 kind of thing? So it was the it was the the eight, the ability to push each other on some of the smaller things that I guess as a younger kid I was like no I I don't I don't, don't want to be a nerd kind of thing it it turned into oh like it's actually cool to get good grades wow what a revelation you know um, uh, I I think I I think that does that answer your question absolutely thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. So you, you had mentioned St. Peter's. Oh, so, yes, yes. So I did consider other schools. Um, again, primarily I was focused around, around swimming. So in my head, I'm like, I want to go where all the best swimmers go. We're talking at the time, we're talking University of Texas. We're talking University of Florida, um, University of, of California at, uh, at, well, I can't remember who it is, Stanford. Um, but those those schools didn't really didn't really um, do it for me. Um, I did like University of Florida, but that was that was like really far away from my family. Not really sure if I wanted to to do that. Um, but so I had narrowed down my list to Howard University, um, East Carolina University, and. Um, uh, there was a third one that I can't remember right now, but my top two were Howard and, and East Carolina. And I was all for going to both. Eventually I, I linked up, um, both of them division one. I linked up with the Howard coach. Well, I linked up with the ECU coach and he was like, you know, I, 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 I can appreciate you, but really the only sort of money I can give you right now is for, uh, for a room and board. That was the only thing it was going to cover. Everything else would have come out of pocket. Um, I had gotten accepted to their honors program. I was kind of really excited about going there. I was really excited. Um, growing up, I would see in the summer when I'm in when I'm in North Carolina, I would see their their uh, advertisements all over the place. Um, 
Oh, the, and the third one was, was University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Chapel Hill didn't give me any money. I said, all right, well, maybe that's just not in the cards for me. So I, I quickly ruled them out, right? Uh, Howard, extremely interested in Howard. My mother went to Howard. Um, I was looking for, I had just gone to their homecoming. I was like, oh, is this what college is like? Sign me up right now. Uh, got in touch with the coach, was digging it. Uh, me and, and, and a buddy of mine, we were both heading to Howard. And then something happened between our last conversation in like January to March to spring time frame, And it's time to sign the, uh, the national letter of intent and couldn't find the coach. He was, he was not, not responding to emails, not answering calls. You couldn't even see his name on the, on the, the Howard Bison athletics page. Like they had like removed all trace of him. Um, so I was in a state of, okay, well, what now? Um, because I could, I could go to ECU, um, uh, but again, they're not really paying me what, what would be beneficial, um, to set me up for after school. Cause I would, I would have been in a lot of debt. Um, my, my club swim coach at the time had a good relationship with the, uh, the coaching staff at St. Peter's at the time it was St. Peter's college. Um, so he had a good, good coaching, a, a good relationship with them. He said, Hey, I talked, uh, talk to them. I know this is not where you want to go. Um, but talk to them and just come back to me and, and see what you think. So I went there, went on a, a recruiting trip. It was cool. Um, got to learn the school, got to learn the, the team and it was more or less a, who's going to pay me more to go to school. That's what it boiled down to. Um, I still had to take out loans for St. Peter's, but I could either take X from East Carolina or I could take X plus Y from St. Peter's. So I chose to go with the one that made most financial sense. Um, and I ended up in St. Peter's. Um, I do not regret that decision. It was, it, I think it was the best one I, I made at the time. Um, and I, I, I tend to not have a lot of regrets because I think I'm in a good place in my life now. And you start changing onesies and twosies and things start spiraling out of control at, at a certain point in time, at a certain point in time, you, you don't recognize it anymore. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't exactly know if I would have done it again, but I am glad I went there because some of the people I've, I've met there um, are outstanding people and I would not have met there in anywhere else. Um, so that, that's kind of what, 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 you know, how I ended up in Jersey city, New Jersey. Thank you. Uh, Wilson, do you have a question for Captain Hart? Yes, I do. Um, thank you for explaining you to explain us the difference between the Marine and soldier. Thank you. Now my question is, what is the difference between enlisted Marines and Marines Corps officer? So uh, the difference between enlisted and officer, we're, we're talking an entirely different job description. Um, when you need somebody to do something, it's the enlisted Marine that is actually doing that task. Um, there has to be people who are supervising the task, um, who, who have a little bit more clarity to the bigger picture. And that's where the officer comes into play. Um, the officer is, is, is developing the plans. Um, they're, they're going through the rules, make sure everything is abiding by the, the, the standard that's happening. But the, the actual person, I'm going to say, doing the work would be the enlisted Marine. Um, that's not to confuse it with the officer is just standing by, you know, uh, watching, people, watching people work. No, there, there should absolutely be a... Um, a, a an in touch um, understanding of what it is you're supervising, but it's not a you know if, if I am if we're at a, a maintenance unit, me as the officer, I'm not you know under the truck turning the wrench. I'm ensuring that a we're on time, 
B, that all the parts are being ordered that, that need to so that you can do your job. Um, and that our readiness across the board is as high as possible. Um, understanding that, you know, nothing's ever going to be 100%, uh, but getting to that 100% as quickly as possible, as, as, uh, as efficient as possible, um, and as correctly as possible, uh, that would be the, the, the difference. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Devin, do we have any questions from the audience? Um, yes. Someone asked, Mr. Hurt, can you please speak about the ranks in the Marine Corps from private to sergeant and from lieutenant to general and how the education level works? So in, in order to be an officer, it's going to be kind of convoluted. In order to be an officer, you need a, a, uh, uh, a bachelor's degree at, at a minimum. Um, that's not including the, the chief one officer, um, but we're talking from lieutenant up, um, that are just, that are unrestricted officers. You need, you need a, a at least a bachelor's degree, um, from private to sergeant major, um, you are, you're gaining as the years go by, you're gaining experience, um, the same way from lieutenant to general, um, but at different levels. So as a private and a private first class, you are responsible for you. You need to make sure that you wake up on time, you get the formation on time, you shaved your face, your boots, your, 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 your uh, boots are laced the right way and you're learning your job, right? Um, as, you, as you grow older, it, the more responsibility will follow. So I went from you know, being a private PFC and now I'm a sergeant, uh, I'm, I'm a squad leader. I'm, you know, I went from being in charge of myself, I'm now in charge of 12 other human beings and I'm responsible. I'm, I'm looking to them to making sure that, Hey, you're doing what you're supposed to do. Hey, my squad is, you know, it's tight, including myself, right? You start going through the ranks. Hey, now I'm responsible for about 40 ish of you to make sure you're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to do. And that, that just keeps going up as you go up the chain as Lieutenant, you're starting off with 40. So, you need to have your stuff straight and or um, be able to compartmentalize um, where, where your deficiencies are so that it's not impacting other folks. But you're starting off with the responsibility of around 40 other human beings um, that you have been entrusted to care for, to train and develop. Um, it's, it's that development piece that is critical because what we're called to do, um, it's, it's not a matter of, hey, I, I see you, you know, at nine o'clock. Um, I see you working throughout the day. All right, you go home at five. I'll see you again tomorrow, right? Um, we do have a work schedule, but the end goal is, is to, to carry out the missions of the country. In other words, national security is up, up front the foremost uh, important, right? Um, so the training and development piece is geared toward that, um, which it's, it requires hard and realistic training, right? So you as a Lieutenant in charge of 40 people, you are in charge of developing the hard and realistic training efforts that some of the Marines are not going to like, but the majority will understand that there's a purpose behind this. You know, nobody likes, nobody actually likes sleeping in the dirt and getting rained on for three weeks, right? That's not just something that, well, that's not most people uh, go, go, uh, go off and, and do on their free time, right? But there's an understanding that this is life and we're out here to do a mission and it's probably going to rain. So you need to be able to adapt and overcome, um, uh, fix any failures you've got moving forward or navigate around the failure and proceed on so that, you know, at the end of the day, we can all make it home. Um, and that just is amplified as you progress through the, uh, through the ranks. So as Lieutenant starting out with 40 folks, as a captain in charge, a uh, company commander, you've, you've got around 150 ish, uh, plus or minus, I say probably plus or minus 50, um, you know, make, make your way up to Colonel. We're talking about, you know, a, 
couple thousand um, that you're in charge of. You know, generals have have a larger, broader picture um, and a lot more responsibility of Marines' lives, Marines and sailors' lives that they're holding. Uh, the education piece aspect of that comes a with the with the uh, advancement of, of your timeline, right? But there's an understanding that you are promoted to the rank of sergeant. You are expected to carry out all of the things that a sergeant is responsible for. But when you when you just look at somebody who has the, a sergeant a sergeant chevron on their collars, you can't tell the difference if they got promoted last week or three years ago. But there is a difference in education. So uh, there has been an attempt to standardize uh, what a sergeant should know. Uh, so it's not just this sergeant major saying, hey, I think he should know this. And there's another one saying, no, he shouldn't know that because he doesn't do that. You know, There's a standard across the board, generally speaking, for the, the rank in which you are and the job in which you are uh, and an understanding of how to perform that job. Right. Um, that's that's within the military aspect, um, but there's also the other side, which will dramatically increase your proficiency of the civilian education. Right, your your um, your exposure to various cultures and the understandings of those cultures will will directly help impact you um, in supervising and leading, you know, the, the troops under your care. Uh, understanding how, uh, you know, Plato thought will help get into your mind of, well, I can't talk to this Marine the same way I can talk to this Marine because different people have different understandings of the same exact situation. So I really think that's where the civilian education piece comes into mind, not from a technical aspect, but from an, from a, an everyday uh, being around people and understanding being able to effectively communicate with them. Um, you, you, you get somebody who's kind of, kind of they're under your charge and they're not really listening to what you're saying. There, there's not a, hey, I'm going to trade this one for somebody else. Like you need to figure out how to get to that person because you are responsible for them. Um, and the other side to that is their action or inaction could affect everybody else in their unit. So being able to get to that, that, that person that you have not had that connection with, that is where I really think the advancement of civilian education comes into play. Thank you. Um, Sebastian, do we have any questions from the audience? We do. So from KA, she asks, um, what is one piece of advice you would give to a high school uh, juniors and seniors about transitioning into college or a career? Ooh, um, so going into the next step, you got to find something that you're passionate about. Um, I didn't make this up, so I won't lay claim to it. But if you find something that you love, you will never work a day in your life. Okay. Um, understand that you are not going to love your job every day. Right. Um, I love being a Marine. I have it with a lot of pride. I love my job probably about 40% of my life, but the, 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 the 40% makes up for that 60% because I'm passionate about it. Sometimes I can't even remember the bad times because all I can think about is, is moving on to the, to the next greater good um, in my career, right? Um, so I find something you're passionate about and find, make, make, make it happen. Um, if it's, you know, you're thinking about going into the military, military is not for everybody, right? Um, there's some things that should not be forced. Uh, we're talking about, you know, setting yourself up for success for the rest of your life. I think that's something that needs to heavily be thought about. Um, but understand, take a, take a good hard look inside of you and, and find what it is that you truly love. Um, if you truly love inspiring people um, and you just happen to be really good at fractions, maybe being, being a high school teacher or college professor 
that's the way that you can reach out and touch somebody, you know, get them to, to unleash their inner potential. Um, and, and that, that will yeah, essentially pay dividends for the betterment of society, just in my humble opinion. Thank you. Um, Mr. Rossica, do you have any questions from the audience or from yourself? Um, yes. My question for you is, um, you mentioned just even now, and um, you said the military is for some and it's not for others. Mm -hmm. So who is it for and who is it not for? Could you, you think you can put to words that? Put that into words, sorry. So I, speak, speaking from a, from a Marine aspect, um, we, are, we are very harsh on, on how we handle certain things in life. Um, a lot of times very blunt. Um, most of the time it's gonna be rough. Um, understand that it is the, the national security is the very first priority and sometimes the only priority. Um, so if, if you're coming in, if you're coming in the Marine Corps um, or the military and you're like, you know what, I, I, I just kind of want to just kind of want to float about. I'm not really about anything. Um, it, it's not going to be the place because we have a we have a constant mission that we are are, are trying to uh, accomplish. Um, missions change all the time, but the, the betterment of the organization that that is part of, of everything we're trying to do. Um, if you are if you're going in. Um, You, you you wouldn't you wouldn't send a you you wouldn't send a, a, a wrench to do a job of a screwdriver, right? Um, that sort of concept. If you don't feel as though you have the personality for it, um, the physical aspect for it, um, then the, the or, or the mental fortitude for it, then it's probably not for you. There's something for you. This just probably isn't it. Um, because it, in this line of work weird things happen to uh to people um and being being able to come to it with with a tough and, and resilient mind um to start with that's i think that's that's the biggest piece the resiliency will be built while you're in but you got to have, have a good platform to begin with okay thank you, thank you. Um, we have roughly about five minutes left in this uh, episode or interview, if you will. Do uh, you have any unanswered questions or questions that are still lingering in anybody's thoughts? I, I have another follow-up one question if I can ask. Um, you, I'm, I'm always taken back by the, um, the, the fact that someone in the military and let's say especially a marine that how do you go from wanting to become a marine for different reasons and transition to a place not only fulfilling whatever those reasons are most likely but how do you get to a place where you're willing to give your life for your country for people you don't know i mean that's to me is an amazing transition i mean what happens during your military training um if I'm using the right words, if not, I apologize, that gets you to that point. I mean, it's amazing to me that you guys get to that point. And how does that happen? So I, I think part of soul searching, which I think is something that you should do on a, on a regular basis. Um, I don't think you have, you truly figured yourself out the first time you think you figured yourself out. Um, because the world changes and it, it, as it constantly evolves, you constantly evolve, right? And hopefully it's, it's in, 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 in a better way. Um, but part of, the, part of the oath of enlistment or, or officer's oath um, is I state your name, do solemn swear to support and, and, and defend the Constitution of the United States, right? Um, I do not believe, and I think history has shown that we have always been on the right side of history, right? I think it's quite blatant that that is a thing. But I do believe 
that the the idea of the 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 constitution the thing that i have sworn to protect and defend um i think that is what holds us in 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 a high regard so even though at at times we do terrible god awful things i think because the people who believe in that document believe in that idea i think those are the people who can help right the ship right um and so to kind of transition that to uh understanding that uh, weird things happen in the world um and that this this idea that we have we have solidified um at certain times can, can things can pose a threat to it i think it should be protected at all costs um the, the constitution has constantly uh evolved from its initial uh ratification in 1787 right two years later we got a whole a whole bunch of different amendments what we now know is the bill of rights a couple years later we start tacking on some more amendments and we understand it i mean it's it's like written proof that we as a human as an american society we we are evolving um because the same ideals that we had in 1775 are somewhat the same but i think they're better now right and now for the love of god cannot be where we end right but if we have come you know x x amount of distance in that amount of time then what that tells me is that this cannot be the stopping point it tells me that that it has withstood a lot of trials and tribulations and the idea of it um has made it through the test of time so that means that we're only in we're only in store for more change it, it's it's bound to come now it might come slow um and it might be painful but it's still going to be there and that is something i can i can get behind i can get behind the change for the next generation and the generation after that um when i when i leave from this earth my name's not going to be on a whole lot of things but i would like to i would like to think that at some point in time me and the men and women that i stood with have made it better for something thank you it's very inspiring to hear you say that all right thank you captain hart for uh giving your time to be with us but our time is coming to an end so recommend that we interview well I'm, I'm sorry i didn't catch that last part do you have anyone that you would recommend that we interview do you know anybody oh uh actually um i do know uh, a, an aspiring principal um who is doing fabulous work as a as a dean of students right now um reaching out to the community not only engaging in in the in the the students around her life but always being a touchback reference point to students of her past um so i i will link you up with with her contact information uh as soon as we end this as this uh this interview but yeah i think she's absolutely the right one okay thank you uh i just want to thank the audience for being here and uh, I just want to let the audience know that next week we have a D1 athlete who played basketball and is native to Trenton. He played at TCA and went to Drexel University and currently plays professionally overseas. And I just want to thank everybody for attending, and we'll see you next week. Thank, thank you. you for having me aboard. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Captain. Captain. Appreciate it. If our team Absolutely. can call, please. <laughs>